Yeah, okay, everyone, let's, let's get started. Thank you for, for coming to today's uh, Distinguished Speaker Series lecture from Professor Gary King. Um, I'll, talk, I'll give the intro to, to Gary in just a minute. Let me just uh, remind you uh, that this is an ongoing um, speaker series event from the Center for Data and Computing. Uh, the Center for Data and Computing is uh, still a relatively new center on campus uh, for incubation of data science research. Um, interdisciplinary data science research, I should say. Um, we just closed our se uh, second year of uh, seed grant proposals. That's one thing that we do, basically, is that we fund interdisciplinary data science research across campus uh, as an incubator. Um, we also convene uh, various events, such as the one you're sitting at, uh, to uh, talk about advanced uh, data science and its applications to a, a variety of domains, including um, uh, the one that Gary's going to talk about today. Uh, and also, uh, we work with various partners um, across uh, both the uh, industrial, uh, civil society, uh, go uh, government ecosystem uh, to, um, uh, to identify and explore uh, new frontiers in the data science uh, domain. I want to remind you that uh, Gary is uh, number three of five. Of course, he's, he's number one today. Uh, but uh, we have a couple more uh, distinguished speakers coming up. Uh, our next uh, speaker will be in just 11 days. That's uh, Victoria Stone. Uh, we'll be talking about reproducibility. Uh, all these talks are right here. Uh, and there's always good lunch. Uh, so please, we hope to see you, um, uh, see you later this month. Um, I'll also remind folks that if you are inclined to ask questions, uh, then there is an online mechanism for doing so. Uh, I think this is particularly also maybe helpful for our uh, people who are watching on the live stream. So Slido, uh, and the hashtag is KingCDEC. Uh, without further ado, I will let me introduce uh, our, our distinguished speaker today, who is Professor Gary King. Uh, Gary is the uh, Albert J. Weatherhead, the third university professor at Harvard. Not too many professors at Harvard uh, have that title, uh, just 25. He's also the director of the Institute for Quantitative Social Science. His work uh, develops and uh, applies empirical methods in a wide range of areas across social science. Uh, he focuses on innovations uh, that range from theory uh, to practice. Uh, he's a member of um, a number of honorary societies, uh, too, too many to, to list today, um, uh, but I'll, I'll mention uh, just a couple. Uh, he um, was the founding editor of uh, The Political Methodologist, and he's also on the governing councils of, of uh, many political science associations, including the American Pol Political Science Association. Uh, he's also an entrepreneur. Um, one of the um, uh, interesting companies that uh, he helped uh, found was Crimson Hexagon. Uh, it's now uh, been merged with Brandwatch, and that basically deals with helping companies and uh, others protect their brands on, uh, uh, in the online uh, ecosystem. Uh, I'll mention uh, one final thing, which uh, is that uh, Gary's work, um, uh, to, to the point of uh, the cross-disciplinary nature of his work, um, in my own work on measuring internet censorship, uh, some of Gary's papers in this area were some of the first that I read actually as a computer scientist. Um, so it's interesting actually to be reading social science uh, papers uh, uh, when trying to do uh, work in internet censorship as a computer scientist. And in that area, um, he's, he's done some really fascinating work on censorship in China, in particular uh, how the uh, censorship or lack thereof actually uh, affects the, the political and governing dynamics there. Um, I, don't th I don't know if he's going to talk much about that today, but it's, it's fascinating work and has, has inspired my own work. So uh, now let me turn it over to Gary, uh, who's going to uh, talk about today how you basically uh, develop or derive statistically valid inferences from data that might be private. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks. I'm Max. I got one of these things. I, I'm going to take this home because it will work really well in my house. Um, okay, so um, I'll leave that and take this. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, see, I'm actually larger than life. <laughs> and also, there's, I really like that there's two of these. Let's, let's get to my slides. Oh, there we go. There's two of these because this will enable me to go twice as fast. So. <laughs> um, 
Thank you very much for coming. This is, I'm going to give a talk. This is the first talk in this paper, which was finished just a few days ago, and I posted a new version of it yesterday, and I'm still editing something that I want to change later tonight um, uh, with um, two of my graduate students and, uh, and an assistant professor at UCSC. George, Georgie uh, Evans is um, mathematically fearless. Um, uh, you know how you want to start a, a project, and you're sort of thinking about it, and you just go do it and prove things that some people can prove things that you can't prove. Other people can take things. Other, other people can take things that aren't true and change nature and make them true. At least so it seems. <laughs> um, Meg is also a third-year graduate student in the Harvard Government Department, like Georgie, um, and she has a little side. She's a full-time graduate student in the, in, in, in government. Um, she has a little side project. She's the chief data scientist for uh, uh, Joe Biden. Serious. <laughs> and Aberdeep, who we call Abracadabra, um, uh, I got to interview all the best people in, or many of the best people in differential privacy from, uh, at Facebook, where they brought them all there because this was this big problem that I'll explain to you. Um, and uh, and I, I literally was like, it was like a dating game. I was finding a co-author to help me solve the problem that I'm going to describe today. I picked this guy. Um, he's at UCSC. I think maybe if you're looking for an assistant professor, I think there might be, you know what I mean? <laughs> Just so you know, OK? I, and, and finally, um, I, I, I want you to know that I, I, this, I'm going to tell you the same story for anybody that was here yesterday, that I brought this suit as a sign of respect, OK? Now that we have that part over, um, <laughs> I can give the talk. <laughs> OK, I'm going to um, put this, I'll put this here. OK, great. All right. Um, so uh, I'm a social scientist. Um, <clears throat> we have, in the social sciences, more data than ever before. We've made way more um, uh, spectacular, interesting discoveries than ever before because of the, of the availability of the data. The, the, the actual thing that generated it was the ability to analyze the data. But in any event, that's a really terrific thing. However, we have a smaller fraction of the data in the world about the people that we study than ever before in history because most of the data in the world is locked up inside private companies. We have to figure out some way of working with industry like never before. Right? It has to be the case that, 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 we, that we do this. Um, and so this is one effort to do it. So, I was, so, uh, so I'm going to describe how to solve political problems technologically. And one of them is making data available from industry. Um, <clears throat> another one is differential privacy. Um, we're going to connect differential privacy, which is computer, uh, computer science innovation, to uh, uh, well, it came from the social sciences, just so you know, uh, to, uh, to statistics. Um, and that's inferential validity. Um, we're going to come up with a general purpose, statistically valid, differential, differentially private algorithm, which was the problem that we set out to solve a year ago to, to make data available from Facebook. And then I'll show you how it works in practice. Um, all right, so <clears throat> we're going to convince Facebook to make data available for researchers to analyze to try to figure out the effect of social media on elections and democracy. That was the task. Um, and we're, and, and, and we're going to try to solve this political problem of convincing them technologically. And the solution is going to be constitutional design. Unlike what we're really going to, most of what we're going to talk about today, that's really what it was. So I'm out at Facebook. I'm trying to convince them to make, da make data available. My daughter's an undergraduate at, at Stanford, was, was an undergraduate at Stanford, so I go visit them sort of regularly. And I go so see people at Facebook. And, and you know, I'm not really making much success because, as evidence, I've gone there for years and had very nice conversations with them, but I didn't come back with any datums. <laughs> you know? um, so I'm in my hotel room packing to go home, and I get this email. And the email says, hey, what do we do about this? And this was Cambridge Analytica, right? <laughs> right? Cambridge Analytica, when a single academic researcher violated his responsibility and gave away all the data and screwed up everything for the company, <laughs> okay? And for the rest of us, in fact. Um, so um, this was the worst time lobby, lobby event in the history of the world. <laughs> um, and it was time to go home. So I went home. Fine. I got to visit Ella. Um, uh, three days later, they call me up and they say, hey, Gary, could you do a study of the 2016 election and tell everybody that we didn't change the outcome? Or maybe, <laughs> if, or maybe if we did something wrong, tell us what it is and we'll change it right away. <coughs> Losing $100 billion in market cap sort of focuses the mind. <laughs> um, so I said, I'd love to do this study. It would be really terrific. But I need two things, and you're only going to give me one. 
Okay. So what are those two things? <clears throat> I said, well, first, I need complete access to the data and the people and the processes in the platform, right? Something you give employees, okay? And then I need something else that you never give employees, which is no pre-publication approval. I need complete academic freedom. It can't be the case that I write the article, you don't like the article, and you prevent me from publishing it. So I need those two things. And they said, oh, you're right. You can't have those two things. I said, oh, OK, well, I'm not doing the study. And they said, no, 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 we still want you to do the study. I said, well, OK, give me those two things. And they said, no, no, we can't give you those two things. I said, OK, I'm not doing the study. <laughs> and we literally went back and forth like that. And we iterated until, I, until they prodded me to come up with a solution. And this is the political, uh, technological solution to a political problem via constitutional design. And so I said, OK, so instead of giving me those two things, what we'll do is we'll have two groups of people, and we'll give each group one of those things. Okay? The first group are outside academics that, <clears throat> that send in proposals to study specific subjects, just like if you apply to study government data or anything, you have to say what you're going to study. Um, the company gets no veto over them, so they have complete academic freedom once they, once they do their studies. They, they, they propose to study one specific thing. They have no, 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 no company veto, so they get, they get, they, they're the ones that get academic freedom. Then we set up a second group, which is a trusted third party of senior distinguished academics at an organization we set up called Social Science One. You can see socialscience.one.one, which is a website. Um, and uh, this commission signs NDAs, so they agree not to publish at all on the basis of the data, um, but they get access to everything in Facebook. They understand, to some degree, what Facebook's incentives are, what they want, what they're trying to accomplish, um, uh, all the things that are going on. If one of the academics proposes to study something that would be awesome, like a great proposal that academically we want to approve, but it touches on what is a secret lawsuit going on at, at Facebook. It would screw up things for Facebook, and it would screw up the life of the academic who would be deposed for the next month. We will deny access to that to, to, to data for that researcher. You know, we'll try to steer them around the, around the problem without telling them what it is. But 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 we would stand up for the researchers to make sure that Facebook is not cooking the books and only providing data that would make them look good. And we would stand up for the company in ways that I just described. Okay, so that's, that's the idea. And, and they said, literally Mark said, because like he runs the company, right? He said, okay, right? <clears throat> okay, so problem solved. No balancing like the, the, the public good we could get from data from research versus the, versus the, the private interests of the company or whatever it is. There's, there's legal agreements signed. There's big announcements. Mark Zuckerberg testifies before Congress and discusses in part um, what, th th this, this, uh, this announcement um, uh, and our agreement. Um, there's, there's, there's lots of funding. Um, Facebook right now has 30 people assigned to our projects that are working so, you know, essentially solely on our project. Really great things. There was only one, just one little issue. And the one little issue is that the way Facebook was going to make data available, well, it turned out to be like sort of illegal. Um, <laughs> <you know? laughs> and so that wasn't really good. <laughs> they give every uh, employee and, um, and contractor an encrypted laptop. And you open up the laptop. And like any good startup, you have access to everything in the company. But they have 75,000 people in the company, and I can see your friends, and I can see your friends, and Madonna's friends, and Britney Spears' friends. And so maybe that's not exactly the right way to give an outside academic access to the data who has no pre-publication approval and can publish whatever they want. Right? That's a disaster. That's worse than Cambridge Analytica, because it, it would be legal to do what the guy at Cambridge Analytica did. Right? So obviously, we couldn't do that. So a few months into this project, we realized, Oh, you know, <laughs> that's not going to work, right? Well, what's going to work? So the only thing that's going to work is we have to find a way of sharing data without it leaving Facebook. Well, how the heck are we going to do that? Well, we're going to have to solve another political problem technologically, but this time with computer science and statistics <clears throat> rather than political science. And the idea is we're going to switch from data sharing to data access. 
And this is not only something that, we're, that is going to happen at Facebook. I think this is a general movement in the world. I think in general, we're going to, we're going to slow down. the. We're not always going to uh, receive access by just giving people data. We're going to provide data access. Let me explain what I mean. So the data sharing regime, which has gone on for like a century, is I give you data. Maybe you sign a data use agreement. That's it. I trust you. That's the idea. You're a trusted researcher. I give you the data. And then there's a data access regime. So let me, let me explain each of these. Data sharing regime, it's a venerable approach, but it's sort of failing. There's increasing public concern with privacy, which is you know, good because people like privacy. It's not always good for research. Therefore, it's not always good for the people who want the privacy. But you know, let's put that aside. Um, Unfortunately, scholars discovered that our main method of protecting privacy, which is de-identification or anonymization, didn't actually de-identify anything, and it was almost always possible to re-identify people. The Tanya Sweeney showed that you can re-identify 87% of the United States population by just knowing their date of birth, gender, and five-digit zip code. That's it, right? Wow. <laughs> um, not only does that not work, but you know, nor does presenting aggregate statistics query auditing, data clean rooms, legal agreements, restricted viewing, paired programmer models. These things are not guaranteed to work. As a side point, which I'll explain over here on the side, you computer scientists, you computer scientists have ruined our day, okay? Not only because of these results, because you got like a whole subfield of people that are trying to attack other people, okay? Okay? And that is very nice because you discover potential vulnerabilities. But they're not always actual vulnerabilities, OK? Just so you know. All right, excuse me. <laughs> um, but anyway, obviously, to deal with regulators, we have to deal with potential vulnerabilities, OK? So on this side, I'll say thank you. But on this side, I'm really <laughs> pissed off with you, OK? <laughs> OK. Um, so the other thing is that trusting researchers fail spectacularly at times, right? That was Cambridge Analytica. And then, just to make matters like incredibly worse, even trusting a trusted researcher who's known to be trustworthy can fail. Um, so that's a real bummer. <laughs> you know? So that's the data sharing regime. It's got some problems. So I think there's going to be a switch to a data access regime. The data access regime is the trusted server holds the data, probably the data the people we would like to be the data provider, they don't provide the data. They, pr they, they put the data on their server. They don't give away the data. Um, and they maybe give you access. The researchers are treated not as trusted. They're treated as adversaries who might um, try to find public good in the data, but might also uh, try to look up their ex-spouse's information okay, or, or, or violate privacy in some way. Um, they, uh, you laugh, but that's like the leading, uh, the leading problem case. Right? <laughs> um, they can run. We would like them to run any statistical method and get back a sort of noisy answer. That's the protection, the privacy protection. But um, they can only run that, that query a limited number of times, because otherwise, if they could run it an infinite number of times, they could average over the noise, and then that would go away. So that's sort of the, that's the idea. The goal is to make it impossible to violate individual privacy, but possible, but, but still possible to discover population level patterns. Right? We're social scientists. We don't care about anybody. We only care about everybody, right? So that's the, that's the idea. Um, and this is, roughly speaking, what differential privacy seeks to do, a really cool innovation. Um, it also seems to satisfy the regulators and lots of others, right? And that's, that's really a great thing. OK, so we got to now focus on differential privacy. Um, there is, a, however, I mean, so, so therefore, we wanted to take differential privacy and just say, OK, Here's the problem with the Facebook data. Like they, they couldn't make data available the way they were planning. So we'll, just, we'll use differential privacy. Like where's the, the little sticker we can put on our, our data access machine that says differentially private, right? Well, it turns out there's a new problem that we just, we, I mean, I, I'm sure others knew it, but we discovered this problem in trying to use it, which is most differentially private algorithms are what we would call statistically invalid. OK, that's a bummer. <laughs> what does that mean? That means they have unknown statistical properties. And, and when you figure out what the properties are, they're biased. Okay? They give you the wrong answer. Um, uh, and, and the wrong answer on average, even. Or even if you have uh, lots of data. I mean, they're just the wrong answer. Even if you have infinite amounts of data, they give you, the, they give you biased answers. Not always, but most of the time. Um, most of the 
proposals for differentially private estimates. And there's no uncertainty estimates. In fact, the literature isn't, most of, for the most of it, they don't even think about uncertainty estimates, at least the way we do. I'll explain exactly what I mean. So now we just solved a political problem technologically, the second one I've told you about today. But we got another problem, okay? We got to deal with this problem, okay? So now I'm going to tell you about differential privacy, and we're going to expand it to deal with inferential uh, validity, and we're going to try to solve this problem and then bring this, bring the, make this, uh, bring this forward. Okay, so let's start off with a population of people. You don't know any of these people, but maybe you might know Gary, Meg, Aberdeep. Uh, uh, where is it? Georgie, uh, Gary, Meg, and Aberdeep. Yeah, I think you know Andre also. <laughs> these are my kids, you know. Um, <laughs> in any event, that's a population. Um, so the mean income in the population is $48,000. That's true in the United States. Um, that's the quantity of interest. That's the thing we want to know. Now I'm talking like a statistician, okay? That's, we don't have the entire population of the United States because of this, this dot, dot, dot. I need two lasers. Don't you have a, don't you have a double laser thing? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, in any way, you should have something that, yeah, I point here and it also appears there, right? <laughs> Somebody here can do that, I know that, okay. Okay, so this is our population, that's what we care about. This is the thing that we want to know. Okay, I, you, I, th I think you know, you, I th intuitively, you, like that makes sense. You'd want to know that. Okay. Then we have a sample uh, or a data generation process. I don't mean a random sample. I'm, I mean, a random sample is a very specific data generation process. There's lots of data generation processes. I could randomly sample people. I could ask you for your income. By the way, could you tell everybody your income? No, you don't want to do that, right? So, so right, so, <clears throat> right, uh, around, a third of the, around a third of people Actually, a researcher in sociology that studies sex told me that the most sensitive question in the world is, is, in, is what's your income? Because about a third of the people don't actually answer that question. He, but he said, but if you ask people whether you've ever participated in oral sex, right, only 5% of the people won't tell you the answer to that question. <laughs> okay, have I made you uncomfortable yet? <laughs> now imagine being a sociologist, holy cow. Okay. Um, Okay, so then you have a data generation process, okay, and then you get some data, okay, and that's the data, okay. You don't get the data from everybody, right? The first, the, right, but the, the, the not sampled, we don't, we don't have it, okay. And the goal is to get from this number, which we do not care about at all, to this number, which we do care about. That's really important, okay. The results of the, the sample is not of interest. If we want to know who's, who's ahead in the presidential race, we, we take a survey and we ask people who, who they're going to vote for. And we get the proportion of people who are going to vote for, let's say, Biden. That number is deeply irrelevant. It was 1,000 people that we randomly selected. We only care about the relationship between that and the real number, right? OK. So the answer to that number is irrelevant. OK. All right. That's how we, that's how we th and then, and then so all of statistics is, is set up, or most of statistics is set up, so that we can use these data to try, and, and the knowledge of the data generation process to try to make an inference back to the population. Okay? That's pretty much what statistics is. Okay, so now let's think about the model of inference for computer scientists doing privacy analysis. So it took me a while to really understand what, what they're writing, in part because like, we all have different notation. and you know, It's like I remember I was in one field. We, we, I was at a seminar, and nobody in the room could understand the person that was talking who was from a different field, and we finally learned about 20 minutes into the talk that, uh, that he meant epsilon to be an arbitrarily large number instead of an arbitrarily small number. <laughs> I mean, it was really something. But anyway, okay, so computer scientists ignore the population. They ignore the sample, and they start only with the data that they have, okay? They're concrete kind of folks, right? Um, they start, they, they only care about this. That's it. That's the, that's the, and, they're, and normally, they would make a query, like, what's the average income in my database? And they'd get back an answer, 108, okay? So that's, that's their quantity of interest, okay? But now, we're going to deal with privacy. So in privacy, now this data becomes confidential. So it's confidential. So it gets embarrassed, and it turns red. Shoot, did it turn red? Yeah, yeah, it turned red. It just didn't turn bright red. It should have turned bright red in any event. <clears throat> Come on, that was funnier than, I programmed that up. That was a pre-programmed joke. <laughs> okay, um, so, that's, so then you ignore the first two columns. 
you have the third column, okay? And then in privacy analysis, we don't have a data generation process or anything like that, but we have a privacy inducing process that we impose. And, that, and what that does is it adds noise and censoring in particular ways, very, very specific, inc incredibly creative, interesting uh, ways that protect privacy by very specific definitions. And then once you do that, you get a differentially private data set or a differentially private results of analysis. Okay? And so that, that's what we have. Um, <clears throat> and the goal is to get from this number, which is obviously irrelevant, it's been, you know, it's, it's, the, it's these data perturbed in some kind of way, and we use this information to get back to here. That's, that's the model of, of privacy analysts. And I have no problem with it. It's a fine model. It's just not the model that's of interest to us. Uh, Larry Wasserman, who's a famous statistician, when he figured this out, he wrote, he wrote the following line. I don't know a single statistician in the world who would analyze data this way. Okay. So that doesn't make it wrong, because it, you can understand why you would want to do this, but it just does not serve the purposes of statistical uh, analysis, and it doesn't serve the purposes for social scientists. So, we're, so we'd like to combine these two perspectives on the world, and what we really want is not this in, uh, making an inference to this or this making an inference to that, but I want, I want you to know this was really hard to do in latex, okay? but I did it. <laughs> okay. And that's the title of our paper. Okay. Isn't that cool? Okay. <laughs> okay. And so we want to get from the data that we're allowed to access, which is this column, back to the population. I mean, you know, we might stop for a drink here. That's okay. You know, but we really want to get there. We don't get to see this. Um, we know this. This is totally known. Um, but we don't get to see, you know, which noise it is and stuff. We know the, 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 the noise generating process. Um, and we know this sample and we want to get back here. So that's the goal. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get all the way up to the other end. Everybody follow? Okay. If you just remember that and you, figure, and you, and you say he's, he sort of did that and then you, you go to sleep, that's okay. All right. Okay. So differential privacy and its inferential challenges. Um, so let's think about estimators. From, in classical statistics, we would apply some statistic to a data set. A statistic is like a function that you apply to the data set and you get a number. So like S of D. D is the data set. S is your statistic. That's what you get. Okay. Uh, um, in, in differential privacy, what you do is you have a mechanism, which is quite like S of D, and, and maybe even be the same as S of D, except in the process of making the calculation, you know, think of S of D as the mean, okay? And in the process of calculating the mean or a logit coefficient or whatever it is, you, you mess with the thing, okay? You, you censor some of the data if it's too big, you, you make it smaller and you add some noise in particular places, all very carefully constructed to protect privacy. Okay? So there's a mechanism instead of a, instead of a statistic. Uh, these noise and censoring are essential components of ensuring privacy, and they are fundamental problems for statistical inference. And so we need them, but we have to deal with them. Uh, so let me give you the differential privacy standard of the way that, I've been, uh, the way that I would translate it. Um, uh, what we want to do is think about in, uh, having a data set D and another data set D prime, which doesn't have U in it. And the, the conclusions an analyst would get should be indistinguishable from those two data sets. That's the goal. Okay? And if it's the case that the analyst would be able to learn the same things, no matter what result, they, no matter what statistical method they want to run, no matter what quantity of interest they calculate, with your data in the data and with your data not in the data, then you would probably conclude uh, you would be in, at least indifferent to giving me your data. And if there was any public reason, you know, public good that might be created from it, you might just give me your data. So that's the incredibly valuable idea of differential privacy. It is quantified in this, in this, in my, this is my version of the, of the definition, which is you take the mechanism, the, probab the probability that the mechanism produces some results, let's call that little m, uh, for the numerator and the, de the denominator. The numerator is for D, and the denominator is D prime. So one has U in it, and the other doesn't have U in it. And, and we want to know the probability of getting a result, given any statistic S, okay, is basically the same for the two. Or the, the ratio of the probabilities is in the interval between one and epsilon, uh, plus or minus epsilon. So epsilon, of course, has to be small to protect, to protect privacy. Okay? And they've quantified 
the level of privacy, basically an epsilon. So this is an incredibly important advance. Um, this is the way, so there's other ways of defining the differences between two probability distributions. And <clears throat> Cynthia Dwork and company showed that this was the right way. And pretty much the field has accepted this. And there's an enormous literature that has grown up around differential privacy from essentially this definition. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> the, the, the point of, of this is now how much noise do you have to add? What kind of censoring do you do? You basically have to add enough noise to protect the biggest outlier. That's the idea. Okay. So here's an example of a mechanism. The mechanism is a differentially private mean. Now, what we'd really like is the mean of the y's. Okay? So the mean of the y's, so the, sum, the sum, yeah, 1 over n time, times, it's funny, when I looked over there, there wasn't a 1 over n. But when I looked here, it is there. But OK, never, <laughs> never mind. Um, uh, so, this, so this, basically, without the c, that's the mean. Okay? So now with this, I can't actually cover this thing, can I? In, in any event, so this is censoring. So now I'm going to censor y with lambda. So ignore that just for a minute. Okay? This is noise. And this is a very specific calculation of how much noise. All right. So what are we doing here? So first thing is um, we're going to add noise. Now noise, it makes sense to add noise, right? You add noise, and then that would make it impossible to, to discover some things if you add enough noise. Okay. Well, how much noise do you add? Well, if Bill Gates could be one of the people in the data set, and you don't know whether he is or not, but if he could be, and you want to protect against that, you have to add an enormous amount of noise if y is income. Right? OK, so that means that probably you would add so much noise that we would never be able to learn anything. Right? So what do we do in that case? So what differential privacy researchers do is they do what they, they call clamping. Okay? You just take the data. You, don't, you never let y get above or below some particular number. Okay? I would call that censoring. But clamping is, we just use smaller numbers. Censoring is, no, no, the numbers we care about are the correct numbers. If we mess with it, then we've censored the numbers. Okay. Um, in any event, um, so what lambda is, is the maximum value uh, that we're going to allow. And if there's any value larger than this capital lambda, we're going to shrink it to lambda. Okay. So that's, cen that's censoring. Okay. So we might say, um, you know, Bill Gates might be in the data. Let's make lambda $200,000 of income. And so we'll censor the data to that. OK, now what happens? Now let's just look at this equation, because it's totally cool. All right. So in this equation, we're going to take the mean of the censored y's, and then we're going to add noise. How much noise, how much censoring? Censoring is, is, is controlled by lambda. OK, so if lambda is really big, there's no censoring. But if it's really big, then it goes over here, and it increases the amount of noise. You see that? So it's like this Heisenberg kind of problem. Right? So, or if we, if, if we, if we don't, if we just, we'll just censor off billionaires and we'll make this 200,000. And so this will be, re the, the, so we'll have more censoring here. So we'll have selection bias here. But, and and, um, and that'll, that'll, that's unfortunate here. Um, but we get the advantage of less noise. So you can see how this, just in this one little feature of differential privacy, no matter what you do, they prevent you from learning about, uh, about things. Okay. And we statistically have to get around this. Um, censoring produces selection bias. Um, um, noise it will, will create measurement error bias, depending upon how you add the noise. Um, other examples, this is just one simple example. They mess with the results in lots of ways. They add noise to the gradient function, the optimization function, the x prime x matrix, uh, to the data, to the all the way at the end, to the quantity of interest. You know, like as a statistician, you watch this stuff and you think, oh, no, don't do that to me. <laughs> you know? I don't know how to do that. Like, nobody would ever do that, right? But there's good reasons to do it. Okay. All right. So the statistical properties, no surprise, of these are usually biased and don't have any uncertainty estimates. So I want to fix both of those things. That's, that's the goal. All right. So let me give you some properties of differential privacy because it's totally awesome. And if you don't know about it, it's totally worth finding out. First of all, is it's immune to post-processing. This is great. This means any adversary who has the results of a differentially private analysis cannot, cannot break the privacy, no matter what you do to it. So if, if m of sd, if that mechanism is differentially private, any function of it is also differentially private, as long as it doesn't involve the, the private data. Um, that's totally cool and will be very useful for us in making bias corrections later in the talk. Um, the, it turns out the, all the differential privacy analysis is about the maximum privacy loss. The average realistic privacy loss is much, much, much lower. 
Um, the, the privacy risk is specifically quantified as epsilon, um, uh, rather than like 0, 1 for whether or not something's re-identified, which is a very useful property. Um, if you want to protect small groups, well, the risk only, uh, the risk, the, the, the privacy loss only drops linearly, um, k times epsilon, basically. Um, the, if k is the size of the group. Then there's this very important property of differential privacy called composition. Um, and so if I run a differentially private analysis that has one level of epsilon, which I'm going to call epsilon 1, and then there's another level, there's another analysis which has epsilon 2, the, the two analyses together leak epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 privacy. Okay? So that leads to a privacy budget. So that means there's going to be a privacy budget, a total amount of privacy we're willing to give away for any particular data set. And we will decide how much you'll get and how much you'll get and how much you'll get to, to, to divide up among your analyses any way you like. Um, and that's, that, that, that's basically going to happen. Um, you can sum them uh, and you can limit the risks across all the analyses and all researchers. However, when the budget is used up, no new analyses can ever be run on that data if you want to protect privacy at the same level. You can go back to the data producer and say, hey, come on, please. But you know, if you, if you want to protect privacy at epsilon equal 1.2, that's it. You're done. Okay. Now, that's, that's interesting, because what that means is differential privacy completely changes the recommendations for, the, for best practices and statistics. And we have to at least understand that. Okay. So what does that mean? Normally, when we do statistical analysis, we try to avoid being fooled, right? But what could fool us? Well, the data, data problems can fool us, or researcher biases can, can fool us. And we need to pay attention to both of these things. Data problems can fool us, uh, and so therefore, we run every kind of diagnostic, data exploration, visualization. We look at the, the residuals. We, we, we do every test for autocorrelation and heteroscedasticity, all these kinds of things, all kinds of, new, all, all kinds of statistical checks, we, because we could be uh, tricked by the data. Or we could be tricked by, the, by ourselves. Right? Like We have uh, a favored pri you know, prior hypothesis. And maybe we're making small decisions that are favoring us. Right? And so to avoid p-hacking, which would be the result, we might do pre-registration and say, oh, we're only going to do the following things and tie our hands. Or we're going to do multiple comparisons, corrections, or things like that. So normally, statistical best practices are dealing with both of these things. And they work a little bit against each other. Um, you know, if you're running every possible diagnostic, you may be drawn into uh, developing a just-so story for your data. If you're, if, you're ju if you're just doing pre-registration, you might miss some things. So with differential privacy, it completely tips the scales. P-hacking is avoided almost automatically. There's a deep connection between differential privacy and robust statistics that's been um, discovered, which is totally cool. Um, but there's little opportunity to run to explore the data, because every time you, you, you run a diagnostic, you, you, you use some of your epsilon, you use some of your budget, uh, uh, or, or, you know, or run diagnostics. You're, you're not going to find surprise serendipitous discoveries as much, because you can't run as many analyses as you want. Um, there's a much higher probability of being fooled by the data. So you've got to plan your data analyses very, very carefully and completely different to the way that you would normally. A lot of the analyses that I've done in the past, if I, we did it this way, we never, never would have discovered the things we discovered. So you really have to be careful. OK, the risks are if you don't use differential privacy, then you might not get any data access. Or if you do get data access, privacy might be at risk. If you don't have inferential validity, then you might have incorrect scientific conclusions. Your medical advice or your policy advice might be completely wrong. And then societies and individuals are, are, are at risk. So this is like a big deal. I think we need both differential privacy and inferential validity. OK, that's my, my um, advertisement for my talk. Okay. So maybe I should give you a general purpose, statistically valid, differentially private algorithm. Sound good? <laughs> OK. Um, so here's a differentially private estimator. Um, the bread is an analogy. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this is our private data. Okay. <clears throat> First thing we're going to do is we're going to partition the data into sets. Okay. Ta-da. Okay. We slice. <laughs> we slice up the bread. Okay. So now we have it partitioned. It's good to partition the data because any one individual—that's that's what we're trying to protect—only appears in one of these. We'll do a separate analysis in each one. And that one individual can only affect one of them. So the more partitions, the more that individual is protected. OK? 
Okay? So we partition the data. Um, we then uh, worry that since we've partitioned the data, when we're going to run our separate analysis within each one, certain quantities of interest will have like bigger variance and will be different than if we ran it in the entire data set. And so we'd have to scale them all differently. So there's a technology called the bag of little bootstraps, which is this cool idea, which basically uh, scales up the partition to the, to the size of the entire data set. Okay? And it, it means that if we run the analysis on the bag of little bootstraps data, then we don't have to worry about scaling. Okay? So I just stuck that. You can skip that step if you want to, but then you have to deal with scaling. Okay? Um, so, that's our so that way it looks like the whole loaf of bread again. Okay? Then we take the bag of little bootstraps and we have an estimator. Oh, so what would we make from the bag of little bootstraps? We'd make sandwiches. Isn't that great? And, and for those statisticians in the audience, right? Do you know what I mean? It's a sandwich estimator. Come on, that's great. <laughs> that's a different thing. Anyway, um, OK, so now we have an estimator in each case. Um, we're, we're now going to censor the big ones. So we cut the sandwiches in half. Okay? Um, these are, it, censoring protects the biggest, uh, the, 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 you know, that, the, the Bill Gates in the, in, in the data set. So we censor. Um, we average them all together. When we average them together, we get something that's not like the, the, estimator, the estimators. That's what we really would have wanted, right? We, we, would, we basically want the average of these guys, but we're, now we're going to censor, and then when we censor, we, we get something that looks different. That's not really what we want. But we don't even get to see this because there's another step. It's still in red, okay? So now we've we got to do one more thing before we're allowed to see it. We see it, it's blue, so it's, now it's noise. We add noise. When you add noise, you get something completely different, like a hot dog. Okay, um, so, um, so now you get to see it, okay? But now the question is, you have the hot dog, you gotta make an inference back to sort of the average of the, of the, of the, of the sandwiches. How, how, how do you get there? Well, we're gonna do a bias correction to get us back to the sandwich. And we're also gonna calculate the, the variance, the uncertainty of standard errors appropriately, okay? So let me just do this one more time, okay? I'll put a little D, you see the little D over the, uh, over the, over the, um, the, the loaf of bread at the top? So that's, that's my data. And then I'm going to have partitions, right? One, uh, one two, three, four, five. Usually there'd be more than that, but um, five's enough for an analogy. Um, the bag, this is actually the way the bag of little bootstraps works. It's actually cool computationally also. Not only does it, does it avoid the problem of having to worry about how to scale a variance different than a mean, um, but uh, it's also computationally really terrific because you don't actually take the partition, which is only one piece of the entire data, and have to scale it to another data set that is the same size as the original data set. You don't have to do that because it works by weights. So you, just, you, you can analyze data at the small scale. So it actually saves tremendous amounts of memory and, 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 and computational power. Um, then we're going to take the estimator um, uh, uh, and we're going to you know, write down mathematical notation for that. So we have uh, theta hat 1, theta hat 2, et cetera. The key thing here is this is going to work for any statistical method. There's slight qualifications to that, but for all practical purposes, it's any statistical method and any quantity of interest you want to calculate from that statistical method. So if you're running a logit model, you can use a logit coefficient or more probably a probability or a risk ratio or, or something like that. And that's the key thing of this method. Like I, there is lots of differentially private methods that work just for counts or just for regression coefficients. This works for any statistical method you want to stick in there, and it'll calculate something that we're going to call theta hat. So that's a really important, that, that was, our, that was a, a, an essential part of our goal. Okay. Um, um, so now we're going to do censoring, averaging, and adding noise, and I'm going to do all three of those together in this equation that I've seen you, shown you before. There's a cool thing about teaching. Like, you may have not understood stood this before, but I showed it to you before, so you remember it, so it feels familiar, so now you think you understand it, right? <laughs> that's, a, that's a very important teaching tool. You should all use it. <laughs> um, um, so, uh, so the cool thing here is that no matter what the original statistic was, that is the thetas, um, we're going to take an average, but the average now is not of the original data. The average now is of whatever your quantity of interest is across partitions. The importance of that is that the differentially private mechanism can be the same differentially private mechanism no matter what your statistic was. So that's a really, really valuable thing because I don't want the researchers that we're going to give access to these data to have to worry about which differentially private algorithm to, to use, and I don't want the data providers to have to think about it because they don't know, they may not know about any, any of this at all. So now we're taking the average of these numbers rather than the original data. We're going to censor as before. We're going to have to think about censoring, and we're going to add noise. By the way, the noise 
now um, is we still have the lambda here. So it's just as before, if, if we make lambda large, we don't have any censoring, but we have a lot more noise. If we make lambda smaller, we have more censoring and therefore more selection bias, but less noise. Um, in the denominator, which I didn't describe the last time, uh, is, is epsilon. So if you want more privacy, epsilon smaller. So it makes this, the standard error of the noise bigger, right? So that's intuitive. Um, previously, the last time, this was n, but now it's p. So n was the number of observations, p is the number of partitions. So unfortunately, this number is not as big as it was before, so it doesn't, so it doesn't shrink this whole thing as much. So we would like a lot of partitions, um, but we would, we would have preferred to have n here, but, but that's the price we're paying for having the same differentially private mechanism to work for any statistical method. Okay. So that's how we do censoring, averaging, and noise. But we're going to have to do the bias correction and, the, and, and, and variance estimate of this. Okay? So we're going to take that equation. And I'm going to show it to you a third time, top, top there. Now, now we're going to have to do bias correction. So how do we bias correct this crazy thing? Okay. So first thing is we're adding the noise on the end. So the noise will definitely mess up some things. But the expected value of the differentially private estimate, that's, that's what DP is, the differentially private, the expected value of this thing is going to be the expected value of this plus zero. So we're not going to have to, so we're adding the noise all the way at the end of the process, not to the logic coefficients, but to the quantity of interest, to the relative risks or whatever it is. So the noise, at least just for this one thing, we can ignore that. But what we have to deal with is the censoring. How are we going to deal with the censoring? OK. The censoring, let me just go back. So you see these? These, the, the, these are, these are the, the estimates. We have a whole bunch of estimates across the, across the partitions. We have all these estimates. They have a distribution. What does that distribution look like? It looks like these guys, this. That's why I have it there. OK, so each one of them is a mean. <clears throat> so it's a mean of a whole bunch of things. And there's a theorem called the central limit theorem, which actually, which actually works. So, right? so the cool thing is the distribution of those things is actually normal. Isn't that great? And it depends upon the assumption. And the assumption is that there's enough observations in each one, which we get to control, because we can decide how many partitions there are. So you just make sure that the central limit theorem, I mean, obviously, central limit theorem works asymptotically. And so you don't really know whether it applies. But in statistics, you know, if it's like 30-ish, you're pretty good, OK? <laughs> you know? OK, so this is the distribution, the unobserved distribution of the theta hats. Theta hat 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I'm going to call them theta hat p for partition. Um, there's, there's theta. Theta is the thing we care about. That's what we really want to know. We'd like to know the mean of the, of the results in each of the partitions. That would give us a great estimate of the quantity of interest. That's what we want to know. We want to know theta. Okay? It'd be nice to know sigma squared too, but that's not really of interest. It's really theta. How do we get theta? How do we get the mean, the mean of that distribution? Okay. Well, unfortunately, we can't just take the thetas and average them. We're not allowed to do that because there's censoring. Here's what the censored distribution looks like. Remember this lambda and also minus lambda. The user gets to choose lambda, right? You make it bigger, you can increase the noise, no censoring. You make it smaller, you, 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 you have more censoring but less noise. Um, <clears throat> so we don't want more noise, because if you have more noise, at best, it's going to increase your standard errors. So you don't want more noise. So what do you choose? You got, and also, you don't know any of the thetas. So whatever you choose, you, know, you don't know what's going to happen. So you choose, you, choose the, you choose the lambdas. We know something about the data, of course, and what the results are likely to be, but we don't know exactly. So that's the censored distribution. Okay. So everybody understand the censored? The censored distribution is this area, plus like this area that got, that got lopped off, it gets piled up over here. You see that? Right? So this spike is part of this crazy distribution. Right? This spike is part of the distribution. Okay. So we. We sort of have the censored distribution. We don't even get that. But, but we, we have knowledge about the censored distribution, and we want to get back to the uncensored distribution. That's our goal. <clears throat> um, all right, now the area in each of the tails, I'm going to call alpha 1 and alpha 2. Alpha 1 is just the integral from here to minus lambda. And alpha 2 is the integral from here to infinity. OK, so those are two equations. I, I don't have an equal sign, but you can see what I mean. I'm going to add one more equation. Um, which is the mean of the, of the crazy orange sensor distribution. So what is the mean of the crazy orange sensor distribution? Well, it's this spike, which is minus lambda, times alpha 1. That's, that's what this says, right? This spike times alpha 1 plus this spike times alpha 2. That's what we have up over here. Plus the, the thing in the middle, 
right? The mean in the middle, the mean in the middle is this. T is for truncated, because that's called the truncated distribution, times 1 minus alpha 1 minus alpha 2. Everybody see that? That's the mean. This thing, this alpha, this, uh, this theta c is the mean of this censored distribution. It is not theta that we care about, the mean of the uncensored distribution. We, we do have an estimate of theta c, right? That's our differentially, that's, what, that's the thing our differentially private estimate is estimating because we took the mean of the censored uh, thetas, okay? So now we got to get from that number, from this number, which is a fine estimate of theta c, we want to get to theta. How do we get to the uncensored distribution? Conceptually, we want to take this, 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 this spike, knock it down, and you know, pu pu you know, spread it out that way. We don't know exactly how much, but we want to spread it out that way. Knock this one down, spread it out that way, and take the mean of that. How, do we, how are we going to do that? Okay? So it turns out we have three equations. This is one equation. This is two, this is a second equation, and that's the third equation, right? They're over here too, right? Like this is one equation, this is a second equation, and that's the third equation. Okay. But the problem is we have four unknowns. There's four things we want to know. We want to know alpha one, we want to know alpha two, and the two 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 parameters of the normal distribution, theta and sigma squared. And as you know, you need the same number of unknowns as equations, right? So we got more, we got more unknowns than equations. So how are we going to deal with that problem? Okay. Well, what we do is we go back to the data, right? Now, normally when we go back to the data, we go back to the data all the time in statistics. We just have a ladle and we just scoop out some data. But every time we touch the data in, in a differentially private analysis, we have to pay. We have to pay some of the epsilon. So we pay, we pay. What do we pay for? We pay for alpha two, right? Everybody see that? We pay for, we just choose one thing uh, and we pay for this one. So we're gonna pay for alpha two. Okay, and we get an estimate of this. We get a differentially private estimate, estimate of alpha two. All right, so now we don't have three equations and four unknowns. We have three equations and three unknowns, right? This is one equation, that's two equations, that's three equations. We got three unknowns, right? The three unknowns are theta, the thing we care about, and also sigma squared and, and, and alpha one. But we got three equations and three unknowns. So we use the three equations to solve for the three unknowns, um, and we get an estimate that we care about. It's a bias corrected estimate. Okay? We correct for the bias in the censoring. Everybody, on, everybody follow? Well, somebody want to ask me a question? It would make me deeply happy if you <laughs> asked me. Can you say why you pay for alpha 2 rather than alpha 1? That's a good question. Technically, there's no reason why we would choose alpha 2 rather than alpha 1. Computationally, we, we, we try to do which one's bigger. Because if it's so small, then it just would be hard to estimate numerically. Okay. So yeah, there's no particular reason. Right. OK. Did everybody see what I'm doing? Right? We're, we're making a bias corrected estimate. OK. So I need one more thing before I show you the results, which is the variance, est variance estimation. So let me just show you one page of how we estimate the standard error of the bias corrected estimate. OK. Um, so, uh, so one thing that we might think of doing is I just gave you an algorithm that produces a differentially private estimate, and then I use the post-processing uh, property to calculate a bias-corrected estimate. So why don't I just make my, and I told you this works for any quantity of interest. So why don't I just use the standard error, or the variance of the thing, as my quantity of interest, and go through and do that? Does not work. The reason it doesn't work is because theta hat, because what we would get if we did it is we would get a differentially private estimate of the variance of theta hat, which is not the bias corrected estimate. It's not the variance of the bias corrected estimate. It's the variance of the estimate we don't get to see. Well, that's not very helpful, <laughs> you know, right? So it's, it's, it's completely useless, right? And it is the way in the literature, they, when, when people have been prodded, hey, where's your standard errors? They just run the algorithm again. But it actually, that's just totally wrong. Okay, so what do we do? All right, so we use um, uh, an adaptation of, of standard simulation procedures. We, in the social sciences, we call this uh, cl Clarify, which is a computer program I wrote like 20 years ago, um, which, which does this, and you do it by simulation. It's quite intuitive. So, <clears throat> so what you do is we have these two things that we know, which is theta hat dp and, and uh, alpha hat dp, alpha hat 2 dp, right? So there's two things on the left-hand side. Okay. Um, then we're going to draw those. We're going to take random draws of those where the I's stand for the i draw. And we're going to take draws of those from a bivariate normal distribution. OK. 
Okay, I'm going to assume um, the central limit theorem apply, applies here too. Um, the mean is going to be the two estimates we have. The, 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 the mean of uh, the, the estimate of theta hat, this is not the bias corrected estimate, it's just the, the differentially private estimate. Um, and the, and the, and the, uh, so the point estimate for theta hat and the point estimate for, for, for alpha hat. And the variances we proved, it was really painful to prove this. Not that the proofs are very hard, it's just hard for us to do. And so I want some, I want some empathy from you, okay? We worked really hard on it. Okay, <laughs> okay. in any event, um, we showed that the variances that you needed to be able to simulate, to be able to simulate, you need the, the mean, which we have, and the variances. Um, we showed that the variances were all functions of the disclosed, the parameters we had, so we didn't need to dip into the data and pay anything else. We then bias correct in the same way as the previous slide. You take the simulations from there, you stick them into our bias correction slide on the previous page, and out comes those three parameters, because we had three equations, three unknowns. The, we mainly care about the first parameter, the, 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 the theta tilde, which is the bias. This is the bias corrected estimate. We, we, get a whole bunch, we do this whole thing a whole bunch of times. We get the bias corrected estimate. We take the standard deviation of the bias corrected estimate over the simulations. That's an estimate of our standard error, okay? So that's our, yeah. So do you, uh, so you, you kind of, you know, you ate up uh, alpha one. Do you swap and do alpha two? I mean, well, well, one, well, once we, you know, yeah. Well, once we, um, we, we well, we, yeah, we, I mean, sorry, this gets us alpha one, um, but we have alpha two right here. So we don't need to bias correct there uh, because we have it, basically. I'm just talking about the anchoring. Basically, when you select the thing to ignore, yeah. right? Um, each of the things that you could ignore are going to have a slightly different consequence on the outcome of the estimations that you make. Does Not really. So mathematically, if we had infinite precision, it wouldn't matter whether we chose alpha one or alpha two. So computationally, yeah. So, I mean, we get rounding and stuff like that. Yeah, but I think it's okay. So. Yeah. Um, uh, so, um, and, and one cool thing about this process is normally in statistics, if you do, bi you do bias corrections, you reduce the bias, it increases the variance. Okay, so it's a trade-off, bias-variance trade-off. And, you know, that's sort of a bummer. But in this case, it's not true. In this case, the bias-corrected estimate, which is this, actually has a lower variance than the, than the unbiased. So we, so we bias correct, and we also get a lower variance. And the reason why is because we dipped in to get alpha 2. And that was part of the bias correction. And so we used more data to, 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 to get the variance. So if you use our procedure, you get a less biased estimate, and you also get a lower variance. So mean square error is, is, is higher. OK. So let me just show you this in practice, okay. <laughs> in simulated practice. Um, <clears throat> OK. So we're, so we're still gonna, going to ev evaluate this in finite samples. All right. Here's sort of the main results graph. Um, the, in orange, you see this thing falling off the cliff. That's the uncorrected estimate. The horizontal axis is the amount of censoring. Over on the, on the right-hand side, there's no censoring. And then the more censoring you have, the farther away it is from zero bias, which is at the top. Okay? So the more censoring you have, the more bias there is. And this is the standard thing in the literature. You just have more and more bias, and you, know, you just sort of deal with it. I think actually, I, I, we think of it as bias. In the literature, I think they just think of it as, well, you know, it's a perfectly good estimate of the clamped results. You know, it's true, but I mean, <laughs> it's just like I don't care about that number, right? So if you actually care about the income in the population, then you, you, you worry about that. We worry about that. And this, at the top, of course, at the top is our corrected estimate, our bias corrected estimate. So this is beautiful, don't you think? <laughs> this is just wonderful. I'm just going to stay here for a couple of minutes. No. Uh, um, so, so this shows that as censoring, uh, measured in terms of alpha 2, increases, um, the, the uncorrected estimate increases the amount of bias, and a bias-corrected estimate corrects the bias. This is exactly what we planned. Just to show you that it works for uh, different sample sizes, we fix the other parameters. And uh, this is a million observations. goes down to about 10,000. You can do fewer than 10,000, but it starts to get more variable. Um, so, you know, the data sets we're dealing with are petabytes, so I think we're good. Um, 10,000 is smaller than I thought we would get to. This is the privacy budget, so say on the, along the horizontal axis. Um, vertical axis, again, is the same. It's bias. Um, the, uh, up at the top is no bias. Um, and the, uh, the uncorrected estimate has lots of bias. Um, doesn't really change uh, depending upon how much of epsilon you wish to spend. 
but no matter what it is, you get, you get a, um, a correction. Um, uh, let me give you our standard errors. Um, the, the two darker lines, the horizontal axis is epsilon, the vertical axis is the standard error. Um, the two darker lines, one of them, they're almost on top of each other. One of them is this, the estimated standard error of our bias corrected estimate. That's what you would report. And the other one is the true standard deviation uh, that you're tr we're trying to estimate. And as you can see, that these two lines are almost, you know, the gray one and the blue one are almost exactly, on, you know, here you can see them diverge just a little bit, but they're pretty much on top of one another. So that means our standard error is a good estimate of the, of the truth. And the uncorrected estimate, the variance, the standard deviation of the uncorrected estimate is above, the orange is above the darker lines. So we, we are reducing the, the variance also. Okay, and we can, I can show you all the graphs together, primarily which ena because it enables me to delay the, uh, turning to the next page because it's really cool. Okay, all right, let me keep going. Um, okay, so uh, one, one th theory and practice slide. One thing I worry about with these big companies, Facebook and others, is, we, is they make a big announcement that they're making data available. But what they do is, what they might do, is they can use differential privacy. It's they just add so much noise that no researcher will ever find anything. Now, what is in Facebook's interest? Well, Facebook and these big companies, right, they, they have this enormous spigot of money pouring in. So what's in their interest is the status quo, right? They don't want change. They just want to keep everything going. So if nobody finds anything because there's enormous amounts of noise, that's not a bad thing for the company. I'm not accusing them of this, okay? They're, they're good people there. They don't actually mean that. But nevertheless, uh, inadvertently that might happen. And so I wanna calculate what they're actually contributing. If they're making a big announcement that they're making data available, I wanna tell them what it is. So what we figured out how to calculate for every run with no additional privacy expenditure is the, is the effective reduction in the sample size. So here's the, here's the idea. Suppose they say, we're making 100,000 observations available, okay? Um, well, um, that's equivalent, it, what we show, is that's equivalent to making, let's say, uh, 60,000 observations available, um, but you can actually analyze it because it's going to be through differential privacy, right? So differential privacy has a cost, and we're denominating the cost in terms of the numbers of, obs of the proportion of observations lost. And so if every researcher reports this number, then we're protected from the from the, the company announcing that they have a big s success when they don't really have a big success. Um, Second thing is, there's, you always have to choose epsilon, and it's hard to figure out what epsilon is because it's on this crazy scale, right? You just don't really know what it is. So we came up with a way of doing it. Um, this is the standard error of the differentially private estimate. That's the, uh, that, the bias corrected estimate that we care about. Um, and, we, and we show that the standard error is a function of the following amount of stuff, okay? This is the variance of the uncorrected estimate, which you'd, you'd, ahead of time you'd have to guess about, um, plus, this stuff, uh, four times lambda, which you know because you get to choose, divided by epsilon and p, both of which you get to choose. So you can, you can um, reduce the noise here and therefore reduce the standard error by adjusting epsilon. You have to use more of your privacy budget by making this bigger in order to reduce the noise, but you can make that choice. If you're interested, if you're going after a particular quantity of interest that's very important to you, you want to publish that paper, you might use more of your epsilon. And now, like in a power analysis, you get some sense of what your standard error would be ahead of time. Okay, so that's, this is what you can do. Finally, there's choosing lambda. Without a bias correction, you choose either more censoring and therefore selection bias or more noise and more, more measurement error. With a bias correction, um, we just say keep the, the, the censoring less than 60% because it doesn't seem to have any, any problem, any, any consequence. And that's actually great. So if you have 60% censoring, you, you have a, a much smaller amount of noise, but the, but the cost in selection bias goes away because we have the bias correction. So I think there's much more utility that can come from a differentially private analysis because of the bias correction. And finally, there's uh, privacy policies. So science informs but doesn't get to determine the policy, right? We, we try to constrain the policymakers, but they get to make their choice. Um, there's few, if any, implementations of differential privacy that actually meet the formal standards. No surprise, okay, but we should understand that. Um, most use larger epsilon than you would expect. No private, Apple resets its privacy budget every morning. Um, <laughs> Um, that doesn't make it irrelevant, okay? It's still important, but it's just, has, you have to think about it in a different way. 
Um, there's other kinds of protections they put in, like de-identification doesn't work, but it's not a bad thing, okay? So let's de-identify also. Um, uh, except, you know, in a sense, we used to de-identify. Now, at worst, we're going to de-identify and add random numbers and do some censoring. That's got to protect more privacy, even if epsilon's too big. Um, so one last page. We're going to change from a data sharing regime to a data access regime. Uh, data, uh, differential privacy protects individual privacy. It enables inference to a private data set, but not the population. It's usually biased, no uncertainty estimates, fails to protect society from fallacious scientific conclusions. But with inferential validity, um, we can fix things. So a scientific statement is not one that's correct. It's one that comes with an appropriate degree of uncertainty where we know what the properties are of its estimates. That's what a scientific statement is. So we want to make scientific statements out of the results of differential privacy analyses. Um, utility requires known statistical properties and valid uncertainty estimates from anything including differentially private estimates. Our proposed algorithm is generic. Almost any statistical method or quantity of interest will work in it. Um, it's statistically unbiased if the original estimator is. If it isn't, then we're not going to magically make it um, uh, unbiased. And there's lower variance than you would have otherwise. There's valid uncertainty estimates. It's computationally efficient. And it's easy to implement in multiple colors. And, and in fact, we have a, um, a big project from the, uh, funded by the Sloan Foundation to make open source differential, differential privacy software. It's going to be called uh, OpenDP, and we'll, we'll, we'll implement this. I have a project with Microsoft where they've devoted um, uh, 10 people to doing basically the same kind of thing, building open source software. So we'll, we'll put it in, in there as well. And then we also have the project with Facebook, and Facebook is also going to implement this. So I claim it's easy to implement, so I will let you know. <laughs> and this is uh, Georgie, Gary, Meg, and Aberdeep. <laughs> so thanks very much for listening. <laughs>Uh, thank you so much for the talk. So my question is that on Facebook, there are a lot of unstructured data, like text and images. So the algorithm seems to me like mainly deals with the uh, numerical and the tableau data. So I'm wondering how, how does that work for the unstructured data? You're making it hard for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, with text, we can have a term document matrix. So that's quantitative data. I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best to avoid your question. Um, so we can have a term document matrix, and we can use this method. Um, we can do something like that for images, although it's, much, it's, it's more difficult. Um, uh, there have been attempts to do differential privacy for text. Uh, I'm not sure they've completely succeeded yet, but that's a, that's a line of research that, that's, that's quite relevant. Um, to, make the, to make it even harder, uh, you can throw in network data. In, in, in our setup, every row is, a, is, is an individual, um, separate, from, separate from the others. Um, there can, you know, the, 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 there's group privacy, which, which this protects, but still, um, you know, if you have a giant, if, you have, if there's one giant connected graph of everybody in the world, then this method doesn't work, and we'll have to adjust it further. So, lots of good research questions. Thank you very much, Gary. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thanks.